Less than an hour away from New Orleans and Baton Rouge sits the quaint city of Hammond, Louisiana. Often nicknamed the Crossroads of the South, the city is located at the intersection of two of the United States' most heavily traveled interstate highways, I-55 and I-12. With a total area of 12.8 miles and over 20,000 residents, Hammond is the largest city and commercial hub of Tangipahoa Parish. Today, visitors to Hammond can find a beautiful downtown area, bustling restaurants, exciting festivals, an airport, modern shopping centers, a diverse population, and one of the fastest growing universities in the country, Southeastern Louisiana University. Hammond or Tangipahoa Parish gives you a mixture of things that you don't find anywhere else, or at least no place I've ever been or even read about, which is namely, you have a rural area, but you also have a university town, a cosmopolitan area. You have exurbia. In fact, you have really a microcosm of Louisiana. Hammond is the hub of Tangipahoa Parish. Of course, we're home to Southeastern Louisiana University and the North Shore Technical College. So we're very blessed to have those in our parish. We have a lot of eateries, the boutique shopping, the arts, Columbia Theater, the African American Heritage Museum. It's fun, people are happy. The kind of people that live in Hammond are the people that you want to surround yourself with. It's a great place to have your family. However, before it became a thriving city, Hammond was a vastly different place. The settlement of Hammond at the beginning, you know, if you say the, the, the origin point of Hammond, you know, is, is subject to a little bit of controversy, but, but the facts are what they are. Um, the wooded area out here, one of the things that, the, um, that drew people to the area were the pine trees, you know, and it was an untouched, you know, great natural resource, you know, and of course the cypress trees to the south, but the pine trees could be used for a lot more things than just cutting timber. Now, the forests were harvested and the timber was taken across the lakes and everything to be used in construction in New Orleans and other places like that, but it was more than that. They would also cut them down and they would create uh, charcoal, like uh, smelting pits, and they, they would build these mounds where you could burn the timber and these charcoal pits would result in usable products from that. Also, tar, pitch, turpentine, resin could be extracted, from, which we collectively call naval stores, could be extracted from the pine trees. And so an enterprising Swedish man named Peter Hammond arrived in the area specifically to do that. The city is named for Peter Hammond, possibly anglicized for Peter of Hammerdale, a Swedish immigrant who first settled the area around 1818. Peter, a sailor, had been briefly imprisoned by the British at Dartmoor Prison during the Napoleonic Wars. He broke jail during a prison riot, made his way back to the sea, and later left his ship in New Orleans, where he used his savings to buy then inexpensive land northwest of Lake Pontchartrain. You could get land from the federal government by settling on it. And there are documents that show his acquisition of uh, land over a long, uh, some period of time between, say, around 1830, he first shows up in the censuses here. So Peter Hammond settles on what is now Charles Street, where his grave is to this day under the big oak tree. And Peter Hammond began this process. He had a little plant here, a place where he could make creosote and, and tars and things such as that. And he was involved in the lumber industry. According to some information that I have found, he had, as a young man, had the, gotten the uh, skill of barrel making. So he started cutting down trees and making barrels and then and these would be sold and he was a, a tar burner because you would seal the ed edges of uh, the barrel with that to, to make it waterproof or hold any liquid or whatever was in it. Ultimately he did marry and, and he got married in 1830 to a woman named Caroline Tucker. Her father, whose name was Zelotes Tucker, I'm not sure that's how you pronounce it. It's Z-E-L-O-T-E-S, and that varies from census to census, too. He and his brother, Beza, Beza T Tucker, those, that family had an interesting <laughs> choice of names, <laughs> lived right next door to each other, Peter Hammond and they. So. Actually, who were people going to marry in that day and time? They were not going to go searching here, there, and yonder as they do now. 
they were going to marry somebody in the neighborhood for a lot of different reasons. They were there. They knew more or less what they were, what families they were marrying into, and that was something that people had to take into consideration then, as they should do now. And then the big impetus to development came through in 1852 to 1854 with the construction of the New Orleans Jackson Railroad. The New Orleans Jackson and Great Northern was a 206 mile railway originally commissioned by the state of Illinois, with both Stephen Douglas and Abraham Lincoln being among its supporters in the 1851 Illinois legislature. It connected Canton, Mississippi with New Orleans and was completed just prior to the American Civil War. And this was a huge deal because it set up watering stations and supply stations for the railroad at, at 10 mile intervals. Now, Hammond missed out on that. It was not one of the initial stops because the, the, it was Manchac, then up to Ponchatoula, then Tickfall, then Amit, then Tanchebaho, and so on and so on north to Jackson, Mississippi. Peter Hammond saw right away that this could help develop this area because he, this would be a railroad. And let's face it, if you're uh, harvesting timber and timber products, if you're beginning to grow some things, some corn and maybe some few other things, and they did grow cotton in this area at one time. There was a gin and a meat. You need to get it to a market, and the railroad was a logical way to do it. There had been some commerce by boat with New Orleans over the years. But Peter Hammond saw that this would, could be an important commercial juncture. He, he wished to see a railroad go through his land and so he contacted people in New Orleans who were putting together a railroad that would connect a railroad that was at Hazelhurst, Mississippi and come t down to New Orleans. And it, 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 this says he donated the right of way through 80 acres of his land and donated the labor of his slaves in the construction of the road not the railroad, but the road that would bring people to that area. It says that he may have had considerable influence with the engineers who surveyed the route for the railroad. So he was working what different ways he could to be sure that a railroad was established in this, that area. So he, he must have been a far-seeing person. This created opportunity for one of the big developers, and some people would say the biggest developer of the area to arrive. And he, of course, was Charles E. Cate, C.E. Cate. He had arrived in New Orleans. He, like many other people who end up in Hammond, was a Yankee, uh, came to New Orleans, and um, was in the shoe manufacturing business. And uh, he became aware also of the uh, property and the available land there north of the lake in what is the Hammond area today. And as war clouds began to develop, and here he is, building, you know, uh, manufacturing shoes. 1861, he realized he was getting all his inventory from the north, and they weren't going to have any more uh, shoe manufacturing facilities that he could call upon on a regular basis to get shoes shipped to the south. So he came to Hammond as a way of actually building a shoe factory uh, to, to make shoes. Now, I know what type of shoes he was going to make at that time, because then the Confederacy came in, and uh, signed a contract with him to make shoes for the Confederate Army, which he did. He realized that, look, two things are likely to happen. Uh, the Yankees are certain to try to seize New Orleans because it's the South one great metropolis and, of course, the key to the mouth of the Mississippi River, uh, but also that if they do take the city, that they're likely to take the surrounding countryside, and so the supplies he needed, like the, the leather and things like that for the shoes, would be cut off. So he moved to this area and uh, set up shop there, partly to be in hiding, so to speak, from the Yankees so that they couldn't find him, and partly also because he would have a ready supply of materials. When Kate and his family first settled the area, it was not much more than a railroad crossing and a wilderness of pine trees. Kate purchased the land from Peter Hammond for 35 cents an acre. He also bought additional acreage from the state, ultimately requiring 15,000 acres of property. And so around 1861, Charles Kate arrives, sets up his shoe factory, and he begins the construction of both uh, the shoe cat factory itself, but also a timber mill, which they, as they cleared the area, they used the products of the timber, um, and he built a big boarding house for his uh, workers, and a couple of more buildings rose up in connection with that, homes and the like. That then, of course, made this a target of the Yankees when they did come. There was civil war action in this area. They were stationed in New Orleans, 
and the infamous Ben Butler was the commanding general there, and Butler was known to want to steal everything he could get his hands on, and he heard there was a lot of cotton up here. So he sent an army up the tracks. In the spring of 1862, the Federals seized New Orleans and uh, steamed up the river very quickly and, and burned parts of Baton Rouge. Now, that's subject to controversy and everything, but all our research is saying, yeah, they, they, when they shelled the city and everything, it did provoke some fires. But they were seeking to intimidate the area and to secure their hold on New Orleans, and so they sent raiding parties out into the countryside and they became aware of the Kate Shoe Factory. Now, shoes were a huge thing to the Confederate Army. Uh, and if you, if you read anything about later in the war and everything, one in eight Confederate soldiers had shoes on. So you gotta understand, these guys aren't just outmanned, outgunned, starving, but they're barefoot, you know, in all periods of, of the year. So producing shoes for them was a big deal. And as soon as federal authorities find out, wait, you mean there's a shoe factory just across the lake producing these things? And ancillary products for the Confederate Army that came out of production as well. They sent raids towards the area. And uh, one of the first big fights, they came right up the railroad at Ponchatoula there. And a lot of the fighting, that time they were driven out of Ponchatoula, but a lot of the fighting, they were trying to get across that trestle bridge to get into Hammond, as the objective being the Kate Shoe Factory and to destroy all the byproducts of it. And they got to Ponchatoula and they burned Ponchatoula down except for the Masonic Hall because their commander was a mason. And they had sent a little naval fleet up the Tickfall River to Springfield. And their goal after they stole all the cotton they could was to attack the shoe factory in Hammond but some guerrillas stopped them between Ponchatoula and Hammond. They turned the army back, and they were so angry that the Union Army tore up all the tracks between here and New Orleans and wrapped them around trees. They called it Yankee bow ties. Uh, in a second raid, and later in 1862, they did reach Hammond uh, after some fierce fighting around Ponchatoula and even sniping and even local citizens coming out and sniping at them because the, the shoe factory itself was so important to the fledgling economy of the area. That's where people worked and stuff. And sure enough, they did take the town. They burned the shoe factory, destroyed all of the machinery, uh, did everything they could to damage uh, the uh, infrastructure of the, the fledgling community there. And it, it was a horrific event for them. But Charles E. Kate was not the type of guy to be intimidated by that. Um, he even did some enterprises where among the things that the people in the area were enormously short of was like salt. You couldn't find it and they were reduced even to uh, going into the smokehouses where meat had been cured and digging up the dirt from the floor of the smokehouses and boiling the dirt to extract the remaining salt from it. When sources like that began to run out, um, they would attempt excursions to Mobile, which was still in Confederate hands, and it had salt works there. And several very successful ones that Charles E. Cade himself organized. And so Cade kind of, my understanding of it is had a change of philosophy. He said, you know, we need to try to become kind of self-sufficient in this area. So he began to encourage, lay out streets. He began to encourage in every way he could people to come to the area. Eventually, finally, the end of the war came, and that would be a big impetus for uh, the development of Hammond. Kate would be very enterprising and trying to, you know, he, he was a northerner himself, so he had no qualms about inviting other Yankees to come in. And this would put Hammond at odds with some of the other local communities, like in Ponchatoula or Amite, you know, which was very contemptuous of, you know, Yankees coming in right after the Civil War and everything like that. Well, Hammond was, was inviting them. And after the Civil War, he began promoting the expansion, the settlement of this area. He, particularly promoted broadly up, up north in states like Iowa and Illinois. You know, Kate was a northerner himself. He'd come from Massachusetts. A lot of the advertisement for settlement in this area was done through the railroad. They published their own little pamphlets and uh, things like that you know, to uh, promote settlement down here so they could sell off some of the land and also create business for themselves. You know, people would start farms down here and uh, grow vegetables and strawberries and they would ship them up north uh, 
on the railroad. So Reconstruction was a troubled time politically and economically in the area. But as, as we were saying, you know, Kate encouraged people to come into the area, and one of those groups was the famous Iowa group that creates the Iowa di division there of Hammond and everything. And these were several men from Iowa that came in. They were investors, and Kate worked with them. Um, they, they set up streets. They, they did all kinds of development in the town and everything, and Hammond began to thrive a little bit. It became very popular for people in the Midwest to move here because two reasons. One was the milder winters. If you ever wonder why Hammond has streets named Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, uh, Dakota, we have West Dakota and East Dakota, even though the nation has North and South Dakota, the early settlers of Hammond did this on purpose because they wanted these Midwesterners to feel at home. If you were from Iowa, hey, you can live on Iowa Street. And the first subdivision in Hammond was that area where Iowa Street is today. So more people moved in and the city began to grow. Because the railroad um, is the big impetus to development in the area and Kate worked very closely with that. Now that, that brought positives and negatives that also created some animosities uh, in the, the, the region there. Um, the, the railroad could do very good things for people that were connected to it. If you were not connected to it though, the railroad um, was the purveyor of the sharecropping movement. A lot of people lost their land, uh, they had to pay back taxes after the Civil War, and, and some people don't realize the people that were living in this area when the war ended, they weren't told you just owe taxes for the current year, they were told you owe taxes for 1861, 1862, 1863, 1864, 1865, all of the years that you were in the Confederate States and not paying taxes to the, the federal government, you owe all of that. So many people lost their land. Northerners would come in, buy these properties up, or other people that were well fixed that could do that. And they then, the railroads came in and helped them set up these general stores, uh, which could charge very exorbitant rates. And most of the people that had been landowners, not all, but most, uh, were driven into sharecropping, which meant they had to work. They, in order, they, they essentially lost their land, but they could continue farming it. They had to eat, so they had to strike a deal with the furnishing merchant who had the local store, and he would allow, extend them food and things like that at a very high rates on credit. On credit. And at the end of the year, when you came in, you know, you had to grow cotton. When you came in to settle up, you never had enough to pay your entire bill, so you were forced back into that. When the railroads helped facilitate the arrival of uh, fertilizers and things like that, it meant some got ahead over others. And a lot of the animosities between these groups um, were based on things like that. You would think that, you know, so soon after the Civil War, there would have been a lot of conflict between the local people and these settlers from the north coming in. Uh, I've not read of a lot of conflict between them. Only The only conflict you see between them uh, at times is uh, political uh, in that, you know, some of these northerners who came in were Republicans and uh, were supportive of the uh, various reconstruction governments you know, and obviously the locals were not yeah. but the to me one of the interesting things about a lot of these northern settlers is the longer they stayed they became more and more like the population that was here they became kind of uh, integrated into the the white society that was here yeah. very few of them continued to be Republicans, uh, you know, they, they switched to Democratic Party. They just seemed to kind of eventually just kind of blend into the society that's here. Yeah. Again, politically though, there was a bit of a dichotomy between towns and communities like Hammond and Roseland, which were attracting as locals that had been here for a long time, called them carpetbagger communities and everything, which were groups encouraging investment and people to come settle from the north, whereas a town like Ponchatoula or Hammond was very much still wearing the gray, you know, and everything, and, and flying the Confederate flag and remembering the lost cause and stuff. So it did create some kind of dichotomy in the area. In 1870, the town's namesake and founder, Peter Hammond, passed away unaware of the impact he made on the fledgling community he helped found. 1830 census, he shows up living in St. Helena Parish. He settled on this property, and the property never moved, but the parish lines did. 
In, that was 1830, it was in St. Helena. By 1840, Livingston had split off from St. Helena. So he, he was living on the same, in the same spot, but at that then, that was in Livingston Parish. By 1850, uh, it was still Livingston, and 1860, it was still Livingston. This parish was not formed until March of 1869. So the first, the first census that shows this parish is 1870 census. And he died at some time during 1870, I think probably before the census was taken because he isn't listed on that census. His, his wife is and some of their children. He, he lived to a really good age, but the, according to my understanding, he was, he was a farmer again, not so much a businessman. And he was out doing some sort of um, insect repelling type work with an arsenic uh, solution and got an infection and died from that. And so he was <laughs> into the um, business of protecting his, his crops with arsenic. This is one that was printed in the old Hammond Vindicator, a newspaper I worked for part time when I first came here, way back in 1934. And it said, says, how Hammond received her name. During the Civil War, there was a large shoe factory owned by Mr. C.E. Kate, where shoes were manufactured for the Confederate soldiers. Of course, those shoes were sent in carload lots as fast as they were manufactured, and many came to know this place as Kate's Switch. But there was a family by the name of Hammond who furnished meals for the railroad men, and by then it was called Hammond. The two names were suggested, and as Mr. Hammond had been a resident longer, and the word Hammond being more appropriate for a town, she was so named. In 1889, the people of Hammond decided that they wanted to incorporate as a city. And this is a proclamation released by the then Justice of the Peace, William E. Libby. This is issued for the 7th Ward, Hammond Station, and I declare as a result of the election held on the third day of April, 1887, the following officers to have been elected. For Mayor, H.C. Mooney, Trustee, C.E. Kate, P.M. <coughs> Gallup, F.B. Saunders, N.D. Hendricks, and F.W. Wright. The proclamation was the beginning of a new era for Hammond. Already, though, the beauty of the place and here's the way they would write in those days. The place has magnificent streets. They are so symmetrically laid off with beautiful oaks planted by his first settlers, Mr. C.E. Kate and Mr. K.D. Wilcom. We have become noted as a health resort and families with their household goods, livestock, fine horses are arriving daily seeking a milder climate where just as easily they might have take up their farming interest and thus the strawberry culture is growing, fruit interest is developing, the wood and timber industry is busy, until this little hamlet had changed completely into a good-sized town. We now have a new schoolhouse. It had to be built to accommodate the great number of children who are coming here. Hammond continued to flourish. By 1889, there were three newspapers in town, a daily and two weeklies and there were more than 4,000 people subscribing to these newspapers, so that's indication that the city had grown considerably. There were two good hotels, and both operated year-round. There was one large sawmill, a brickyard with modern kilns, two box factories. The reason for box factories were if you're growing produce, you got to put them in boxes. They had no cardboard in those days. There was an ice and a bottling plant where they bottled pure water. And it was known everywhere what a great health resort Hammond had. We had the best railroad service. 16 passenger trains stopped daily, and it was the only double track in the South. And the, the writer continues, some of our most important public improvements are street lights, and later on a telephone, 12 miles of paved sidewalks, a complete waterworks system, one of the finest depots on the southern end of the railroad, and last but not least, a $445,000 schoolhouse 
with all the modern first class improvement that, that are available in the whole state of Louisiana. And thus you can see that in the 1880s, Hammond was flourishing. And the people obviously had a great deal of pride in their community. And it was um, becoming a really, apparently a very nice place to live and settle and raise a family. Kate's rationale that the town would grow in proportion to its access to the railroad proved prophetic. Railroad records confirm that in 22 years, income from the Illinois Central's Hammond Station rose from less than $500 a year in 1885 to $40,000 in just one month in 1907. When Kate came up here, it was like a crossing and they had to stop. Uh, when Kate came here, you could get on and off the train. If you went to the track, you could flag it down or you, you know, tell the conductor you want to get off the Hammond Crossing and they'd let you off. Uh, but it wasn't a regular stop, and that's one of the things that Kate did. Uh, he was a holdout on the Illinois Central Line. He wouldn't sell him the property, but he gave it, gave him a right away. And all he wanted was to have the every regular scheduled passenger train stopping him. So if I can get the train to stop here, I can build the town. You know, and that's that's what he wanted. It's like putting a, an exit off an interstate into a community. It makes all the difference in the world. And that, that's what he did. It's, uh, it, and it stayed like that for, you know, for a long, long time. Hammond's next growth spurt would grow from its very own soil. Hammond was about to become the strawberry capital of the world. My understanding is the first uh, raising of strawberries occurred actually closer to independence. And I know the uh, father of uh, uh, Mr. Harry D. Wilson, who would go on to become the Commissioner of Agriculture uh, in the state for years and everything. His father is often given credit for being one of the first people to grow strawberries in the area. But it all moved towards Hammond. You know, with Kate's vision and others uh, working with him and everything, they began attracting hotels and stuff. Like everybody's familiar, you know, with the Oaks Hotel, which a lot of people know probably by its later name, the Casa de Fresa, which means the House of the Berries, of course, and everything. You know, they they then created a spot where the uh, uh, strawberries could be sold commercially and everything on a national basis. Uh, I think starting around 1900, they began to put them on the trains at Hammond. And these hotels that, that grew up were a lot, uh, very important to the development of Hammond because people forget, they think, you know, well, I'm driving from Baton Rouge to Hammond today, you know, today, you know, so I'll go over and do everything I need in Baton Rouge and come back. Or I'll go over to Hammond, do what I need, and I'll just drive right back home. Travel between communities, even if you were just going between Amy and Hammond, it was a long way. You know, imagine, you know, walking that distance or riding a horse or in a buggy or whatever you know so the, the more that commercial activity came to Hammond the more the hotels were established the bigger it grew and strawberry farming was at the center of what was happening because the strawberry buyers would come down they would stay at the hotels right there on the grounds of the Casa de Fresa they had a, 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 a the cabin they called it and everything and basically it was a, an auction warehouse where they would auction these off they would put the berries onto refrigerated cars and ship them all over the country and that was beginning in the early 20th century, but extended into the 1920s, and then right at the start of the 1930s, strawberries appeared to be absolutely a mega economic motivator in the area. At the height of the strawberry industry around the turn of the century, and this is, my wife's grandmother's told me this before, in Ponchatoula and Hammond, they would load as many as 40 or 50 boxcars every day with strawberries. That's when strawberries were really king here. Well, well, Hammond used to be, we had it before Punchatool had it. We were known at the strawberry capital of the world. It was very important to me, uh, you know, as a child, because when I was coming up, my parents raised strawberries. And the only way we got extra money uh, after we finished, you know, raising strawberries at home, we were allowed to go out and pick for other people and make for money. But now, since Hammond has, you know, have had this urban growth, Punchatoula and, and those nice people <laughs> are the strawberry capital of the world. And, and, and I think that's a nice thing. It speaks volume for the whole parish in this area. And then something kind of unexpected happened. One of the things that's very beneficial to our area, like why we have sugar cane and strawberries and things like that, is because we have such a long growing season. And then right at the height, when real money was being made for people here in Hammond and it was, it was spurring so much development, a devastating freeze occurred. And you know, the, the likes of which we rarely have around here. But it wiped out the strawberry crop for that year. And what that made people realize is that 
everybody can't be part of this. The people that had deep pockets, you know, they weathered that. The people that, you know, were on the margins and everything, they realized then that strawberry farming was not going to be what was going to rescue them from the poverty they'd been in since the end of the Civil War. So Hammond leveled off a little bit, and the, the, the strawberry farming expanded out into Livingston Parish and into, you know, uh, down Ponchatoula, of course. You know, again, there's that little bit of competition between those two communities and everything. But it still was very much a part of the economy. Kate died in 1916 at the age of 85. He and his family are buried in the cemetery on the grounds of Grace Memorial Episcopal Church. Today, Kate's legacy can be found all over the city he helped build. He liked putting back into to the community. Whatever was good for the city was good for him, and, but he put a lot into other people. Uh, he was a big, big believer in education, real big believer in education, because he felt if you could educate the people, they became better, you know, citizens in the community, became more productive, uh, and you can build more with an educated population. He was on the school board, but he's also on the state level. He was on the state board of education. Uh, Governor Foster and Governor Nichols appointed him to that position. That was kind of one of his high points, I think, in his life. He was always fairly political in a lot of things he did. Uh, he was active in the community, but he's also active politically through his life as much as anything else. He was on the city council, didn't want to be the mayor or anything, but he was active in politics. And then another big thing happened that was just a huge shot in the arm to develop in Hammond, and that was the arrival of Southeastern, what we know today as Southeastern Louisiana University, Southeastern Louisiana College, before that Hammond Junior College, you know, before that, however. There had long been discussion of um, placing some type of institution of higher education in the central Florida parishes. Um, and there were a group here in Hammond, again, following the same in the, the ways of Charles E. Kate and others, you know, who wanted to attract things. Um, uh, some initial state investigators about this had offered the opportunity to Amit at first, and then famously in the Amit City Council meeting, the council voted overwhelmingly no, because they didn't want the character of the town changed. The university at that time brought in professors from out of town, but these were foreigners. We don't want all these outsiders coming into our town because they were transients, and that's the way they looked at the university professors. They were they were they weren't born and raised here. Back then, you were born and raised in a community; you never left. Hammond, though, seeking to grow, develop, not having qualms about people from the north, whatever it may be, coming in, you know, it, it enthusiastically embraced the opportunity, and though they had some trouble with the uh, school board in the parish at the time, and in fact, it, it came, you know, almost, uh, as they said, fisticuffs in the school board meeting as they discussed it, which us here in Tanchbode Parish know nothing about, of course, and everything. At the time, in Louisiana, there was, the road system was, was atrocious. If you have people ever wonder why we have what we call these geographic colleges. We had Northwestern, Northeast, Southeastern, ULL, which was now the you know, University of Southwest Louisiana, Nickel State, McNeese. It was because you could not travel from here to Baton Rouge to go to LSU. The roads were too bad. So by putting these strategically located regional colleges, it gave the kids on the farm a chance to get an education. And these community leaders came together and they said, we want to establish a college in Hammond. And they went to the Tangipo Parish School Board and the school board said no. Lionel Sims was the one that really had the bug for education in around this area. And he got a, a businessman named Oscar Donaldson to kind of get with him. And then they hit Lu Lucius McGee, who was a very well respected physician in the area and was a person that just seemed to be able to get things done. And slowly but surely, they talked the Chamber of Commerce into, you know, getting a junior college or something here of uh, higher education, let's say. And they started working for it. And then they found out that T.H. Harris, who was then superintendent of education in the state, was in town. So they kind of finagled him without him knowing it to come to a meeting with the Chamber of Commerce. And they hit him with the idea of a college uh, in, in the Hammond area. And eventually, it, it caught a little fire. He, he was not against it. 
and uh, they eventually passed a millage, uh, I think it was wards five, six, seven, and eight, passed a one cent millage to help do some initial funding. And the college was started, and it began to grow very rapidly. And what's remarkable, literally from that first meeting, my understanding has always been that from that first meeting they had in Hammond to discuss it, to the time they opened the doors on the college initially was less than one year. That, that's how deeply the people were eager to see that happen. And it started right where on Morris Street where Neal Corporation is today. That was the first site. There was a, a faculty of five, and I think the first class had 40 people in it. Three times since it was created, Southeastern was the benefactor of bond issues. Can you imagine passing a tax for Southeastern? Well, your grandparents did and were glad to pay it because they didn't need to be convinced what it meant to have a college in Hammond, Louisiana. And in fact, Southeastern came here because our ancestors wanted it, because the business community in the 1920s, in the 1930s, in the 1940s, kept passing bond issues to increase the university to the next level. And today it would seem like science fiction that we would pass a tax. I mean, in 1937 was a big, I would say it was a big year because that's when Strawberry Stadium was built. And with Strawberry Stadium came dormitories, came a new snack bar, came a, uh, the Student Union Memorial Building. Uh, both sides of the stadium had dormitory rooms. The bookstore was there, post office was there. So 1937, and I think maybe a year or two later, McGee Hall was built. And that really, you know, once you start getting permanent facilities, it really begins to grow. At that time, it just, it was just a small, close-knit, good university. You got to know a lot of people. Uh, it was driven by fraternities and sororities and athletics, all had hand in hand in helping the school maintain a, a certain level. It never dropped. It just kind of then, then all of a sudden in the, in the 80s, we just hit the boom and just started, you know, just started blowing and going and, and, and the student in, uh, enrollment increased a lot. They bring a lot of special culture and opportunity to people in our area uh, from all over the region. And, and listen, those guys do a great job with, with limited resources. Uh, we still step it up and, and provide great national award, uh, nationally ranked programs uh, at the university. It's, it's absolutely a, a must that we keep that university fully uh, running and operational and, and integrated into our, our community. Now, it doesn't take much imagination to see the profound effect that Southeastern had on Hammond. And here's why for several reasons, besides the job opportunities, it offers entertainment in the way of the sports and athletic events, plays and uh, dance reviews and recitals, concerts. It also brings into the community highly educated, creative people, artists, and it, uh, it just makes the community a whole lot better place for everyone. I re-enrolled in school because I wanted to enhance my writing skills and I was able to reintroduce myself to a lot of things that I had forgotten about or, or I just hadn't used in a while. But I got that at Southeastern and I saw a love from the professors to the students and wanting them to know that this is the place to be. And if you want to do it, if you make your mind up and do it, we'll help you to get there. That's Southeastern. First of all, you got 15,000 students, basically. You got Southeastern as the largest employer, I think, in Tanchebo Parish. I mean, just those two factors alone, you're throwing in uh, a lot of extra income, a lot of extra money uh, into the parish. Uh, just the one football playoff game Southeastern uh, hosted a couple years ago, uh, the two weekends we hosted playoff games, I think a multi-million dollar income just over two weekends for the parish, and that's just off two sporting events. And just the fact that, you know, you bring in teams, it's just the economy. People come in from outside, uh, gives you a rallying point for, for athletics, uh, for all different phases. Uh, people come in, travel in for ball games. It's, and then without all the people coming in from outside, just within the community, the number of people and alumni in in this area that contribute to the economy of Tanchebo Parish and the city of Hammond and South Tanchebo is just amazing. And I think that's where Southeastern plays the biggest part. It is an integral part of the economy of Louis Southeast Louisiana and the success we've had in some of our academic programs. You know, for a long time, we were known as a very good teacher education 
a school. But now you look at our nursing department, our business department, uh, you know, those are all excellent on a national level, not just a local level. And uh, those are far and wide recognized. You know, and we have some subsidiaries. We just voted one of the top colleges and universities in the country for our food <laughs> in the cafeteria, which, I mean, that's pretty hard to come by. And then, you know, and then our, our TV station here has won some national uh, awards. Uh, just you can go on and on with the, uh, that's part of academics, but it's not, you know, in the classroom like anything. So we've had a very good, I would say, expanding part of the university, and, and that's part of the growth of Southeastern. Hammond even had a part to play during World War II. The Hammond Army Air Base, as it was called, you know, was yet another impetus to development in the Hammond area because it brought, you know, soldiers during World War II into the area and it brought all their families and support personnel into the area too. And of course, it laid the groundwork for the airport which we have today. In those days, it was called the Army Air Corps, established a base here in Hammond where the airport is to this day. And it's hard to imagine now, but this was a rather large base. They had, I think there was eight barracks there. There were three dining halls, recreation center, a post office, a fire station, a, a tower, and a lot of men who went on to have distinguished careers in the Army Air Corps served here. One of the reasons why the base was important was fighter pilots and bomber pilots had to learn how to use their guns. What they would do is they would fly I think B-25s out over Lake Pontchartrain, trailing either uh, big long sheets of, of cloth or gliders, and then let the pilots fire at that. The thought being, the bullets will fall in the lake and won't hit anybody, so it won't matter. You think about it, it makes sense. And they also had a bombing range to the north of the airfield. And I know when I first came here, I had a friend who was a quail hunter, and we used to go quail hunt on what they still call the bombing range. They would drop 500-pound sacks of flour on dummy tanks and other things on the ground. So <clears throat> during the war years, that base flourished. Uh, also, little less discussed is there was a, a prisoner of war camp near Hammond as well during during the World War II period, and they brought German um, uh, uh, POWs in, and they used them to cut timber and clear land and other things like that. And interestingly enough, years ago, when I was in The Hague in the Netherlands at the railroad station there and everything, and a man looked at my backpack, I was getting off it, and he saw I had a little Louisiana symbol and everything. And he said, uh, he looked to me and he said, um, I was in Louisiana, he was speaking to me in German, of course, and everything, and, and then, you know, and, and you know, when I spoke to him, you could tell I was American, we switched to English and everything. And he was like, uh, well, yeah, I was in uh, Louisiana, he said, uh, during World War II. And I said, oh, okay, is that, is that right, you know, down on a visit? And he said, no, actually, ich war in Gefangenis. And he went like that, and he said, it meant I was a prisoner. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, I was like I'm like, I'm Sorry about that and everything, and uh, he said, and, and he said, uh, you know, I said, oh well, you know, uh, uh, you know, so he said, no, 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 it's okay. He said, we were in a delightful little place, you know, nothing but trees around us. He said, boy, I hated cutting those trees and everything. He said, but it smells so good everywhere. A place called Hammond. I was like, Hammond, are you kidding me? I'm from right up the road in a town called Amit and everything. And so he insisted on buying me lunch that day and everything, and <laughs> would tell me stories about riding on trucks through town and everything, and whistling at the girls and, st and stuff like that, and how much it would, uh, you know upset the guys around here. He said uh, there were rumors that, 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 that you know, if, if we would uh, do this and that, you know, go over to some guy's house and help him load some stuff on his truck and everything, that he would get an opportunity for us to get away and drink some fresh milk and stuff like that. And so he had all these little stories to tell, but, you know, there's so many of these little tidbits of history that end up dealing with Hammond, you know, and that's why I love studying this area. And sometimes you say how history repeats itself. After all those years, at the end of the war, the base was given to the city of Hammond, and it languished for a long time. It wasn't in really in the greatest of shape, but people realized we needed an airport here, and they gradually began to improve it. And today, it's, a one, it's an excellent airport for a city this size. And now, the military has come back. We have the aviation wing of the Louisiana National Guard stationed right here in Hammond at their magnificent new headquarters. And we have the U.S. Customs Service here at the airport. And of course, last year they opened an airport tower. 
When it was realized that a national highway system was needed, the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 provided for a highway replacing the old Route 66. As with most interstates that end in a 5, Interstate 55 is a major cross-country north-south route connecting the Gulf of Mexico to the Great Lakes. The highway begins in La Plaza and runs nearly 66 miles to the state line near Kentwood, then continues on to Chicago, where it ends U.S. Route 41. The entire length was completed in 1979. When I-55 comes through, it really changed the economic um, whole stratagem of the region. And um, it, for some communities, it was very sad because uh, towns to the north, say for example, of Hammond, like Amy, Independence, Kentwood, like that, they thought I-55 would be a wonderful boom for them. It turned out to be an unmitigated disaster, though, because what could happen when the interstate opened up, they realized they could get on the interstate and drive to a larger town and shop there. And so soon you started seeing all the little shoe stores, all the men's clothing stores. You know, you're always going to have some women's clothing stores at every place, you know. But, but he, they too were affected and, and uh, the, the various little enterprises that you would expect a town to have to sustain itself began to shut down. But it became a boom for Hammond because Hammond was the closest spot that people in those communities could get on the interstate and get to. There was just one piece of the puzzle still left and that was an east-west corridor. And through the efforts of Congressman Jimmy Morrison, he argued very rightfully so, as we've seen more recently, that the um, New Orleans and I-10 going down into New Orleans was subject to flooding, especially during hurricane season and the such. And he said, we need an east-west corridor that will connect, you know, like from Mobile, Alabama to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, on over to Houston. Morrison was born in Hammond, attended public schools, and went on to obtain the Juris Doctor degree from Tulane University Law School in New Orleans in 1934. Afterwards, he practiced law in Hammond with partner Joseph A. Sims. In 1936, he ran unsuccessfully for the Louisiana State Senate. But in 1937, he wrote the charter for the newly formed Louisiana Farmers Protective Union and launched a public relations campaign on behalf of union members in the Strawberry Belt, centered around Tangiboa Parish. Finally, in 1942, Morrison was elected to the United States House of Representatives. He represented Louisiana's 6th District from 1943 to 1967. Can you imagine, forget Baton Rouge and New Orleans, can you imagine Little Hammond, Louisiana, late 1940s, early 1950s, electing a congressman? Not only did that happen, but James Morrison was able to use his power to get I-12. There was no original plan of Dwight Eisenhower for Interstate 12. I-10 was going through New Orleans. James Morrison got I-12. And th that's what happened. And it was an interstate spur that back at the time had no justification whatsoever because there was no population to speak of on the North Shore. But it's something to think about how times have changed. You know one thing about the 50s, Tangipaho voters couldn't have been apathetic, not to get all that. Well, literally you had in James Morrison a guy, and there's a famous picture of him bringing a flat of strawberries to President Truman. And then of course, uh, ditto for uh, Dwight Eisenhower, the president who came after Truman, of course, and uh, James Morrison was able to lobby. And there were other congressmen in other locales that did the same thing. I mean, the interstate system was transformed from its original concept uh, into a lot more local projects as part of it. But again, if Hammond, Louisiana had not banded together to elect a congressman, and that congressman had not fought to get I-12, we'd be living in a radically different area and not for the better. And so Mr. Jimmy, as we all know him, you know, went before Congress and everything and got money appropriated to get I-12 constructed through this area. And then when you had the confluence of I-12 and I-55 hitting right at the location of Hammond, you had the final piece in place for Hammond's growth. And it has been remarkable in what has happened. You know, you're talking about a sleepy little village you know, even 50 years before with a few little hotels and some strawberry marketing and stuff like that, turning, you know, then getting a college, then getting one interstate, then getting another interstate that, that the confluence is right there on them, you know, the intersection rather is right there at your town, you know, and so Hammond's future, like its past, is bright.
being the largest city and having the interstates cross, I-12 and I-55 across, and the railroads crossing in our city, the great airport that Hammond has, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a must that Hammond is uh, strong and robust. Uh, it's it, it's kind of now the bellwether for all of Tangeville Parish. Um, and, and it, you know, as things go in Hammond, the rest of the parish follows. When I look at Hammond as the, I, I guess I call it the mega hub of everything because everything feeds into Hammond because of the railroads, the uh, interstates, the airport, um, a number of reasons. Highway 51, everything stops here and starts here in Hammond. Economically, it is constantly growing. Uh, in fact, in Hammond, we just added Zaxby's. Uh, we added Dairy Queen and also very soon Home Depot will be open. And then uh, there will be another group of businesses that, which I can't name at this particular time, that would definitely have an impact. Uh, on Hammond. In fact, last year, uh, economically, Hammond had a capital investment, I think the sum was roughly about, to round it off, was like $58 million. And it's projected that going in next year, you know, with the businesses and economic development coming in, uh, that capital investment is vested, is, uh, it, might, it will, may go over um, $68 million. So, so those are very positive things. Then you consider the university is constant, constantly growing. Norfolk's, you know, they're growing and doing an excellent job. They're always doing expansions. And then, of course, we have the technical school and, they're, you know, they're growing. So it's just kind of a good place to be now. My estimation has grown and matured beyond what I'm sure anyone could have imagined. There's an interesting thing. In Renshaw's newspaper in 1894, he has a quote from what, believe it or not, Springfield had a newspaper at the time called the Springfield Bee. And Springfield was a thriving community because it depended on water trade on the Natalbany River. And in the Springfield Bee, the editor wrote, if we are not careful, one day that little community to the northeast of us called Hammond will surely outstrip us in size and importance. And Springfield has a population of, I think, about 1,500 and Hammond has a population of 24, 25,000. So I think the editor of the Springfield Bee in the 1890s could see the future. And that little, that little tiny village of Hammond has far outstripped any other community in this region. This was the very first official state historic marker in Louisiana, and it was dedicated by Lieutenant Governor Bill Dodd on October the 22nd, 1950. And he says, he, he's quoted in this um, newspaper article from the Hammond Vindicator as having said, here in America for a long time, we have been so busy building a nation, we have neglected our history and traditions. And I'm happy that we are now ta taking concrete steps to perpetuate our own historic shrines in Louisiana. So I think that was, very well said about what he was doing and, and what that was the, uh, the first effort to do. You know, uh, one, of, one of the things, anybody that, that lives or has studied or, or, or even is just aware of Tanchapo Parish knows that this region has had a very, very troubled history. For heaven's sakes, until up until just very recently, it was known nationally as Bloody Tanchapo. And the area has had a very troubled past. Hammond was part of that. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of the famous newspaper editor, uh, you know, Hodding Carter, you know, and his father, grandfather, Will Carter and everything, had the newspaper here in Hammond and everything. He, you know, very famously said that he felt like he had to leave the Hammond area because of the intensity of the violence and the passion of people and their politics in the area. So there was a time when, when the future looked dark here, but that has changed a lot. Hammond has been, in many ways, the, 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 the big power truck pulling uh, the rest of Tanchpaho and even the surrounding region into a new place in its development. And with the university here, with the, the intersection of the interstates as we were talking about, with a diversifying economy located in a region 
that at one time people didn't even want to ride a train through it because people would come out and just fire shots at the trains they go through. Now look at the migration of people into this area. You know, we've got the two fastest growing parishes in Louisiana on either side of us. Tanchbaho is growing rapidly itself. All indicators suggest that in the future, Hammond is going to be a prosperous and developing community and that there's very little that can stop that from happening.